Hold on. Good. All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, and to those joining us uh, online, uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you uh, may happen to be in the, in the world. But uh, welcome to uh, today's seminar, uh, America, excuse me, America Skepticism Theory, uh, Anti-American Propaganda and its Impacts in Taiwan's Information Environment. Uh, I'm John Dotson, the Deputy Director of the uh, Global Taiwan Institute. Uh, GTI is a 501c3 think tank uh, located in Washington, D.C., and our work is focused on contemporary Taiwan-related issues and U.S.-Taiwan relations, and we have a mission to further illuminate the public policy discussions related to uh, uh, Taiwan and U.S.-Taiwan relations. Uh, we pursue this through a range of programs, including the Global Taiwan Brief, our fortnightly uh, online publication. We just released a, a new issue of that uh, this morning. Uh, we also have three uh, policy podcasts that we do, uh, GTI Insights, uh, Taiwan Security Review, and Taiwan Salon, our cultural policy podcasts. Uh, we also pursue this mission through public policy seminars, such as the one we are uh, holding today, uh, as well as uh, occasional reports, uh, longer uh, research reports on a, a particular issue. And I suppose that today's event is a combination of those latter two things. Uh, this uh, Today's event is being held as a release event, uh, actually uh, for two research reports uh, on this topic. Um, a report both uh, performed by us here at the GTI uh, titled uh, Chinese Information Operations Against Taiwan, uh, the Abandoned Chess Piece and America's Skepticism Theory, uh, as well as a parallel research report that is being, uh, has been performed by the Information Environment Research Center uh, in Taiwan, uh, titled uh, U.S. Skepticism Narratives and uh, Where They Come From. Um, for the, uh, so the, the overall topic of today's event, uh, the past year has seen a, a growing prominence in Taiwan's media and information environment, uh, for again, what we're calling America's Skepticism Theory, or, or Imei Lun, which is a, a, a broad set of narratives that depicts the uh, United States as an unreliable and even treacherous partner uh, for Taiwan, and one that will abandon uh, Taiwan when its uh, interests uh, call for it to, to do so. Uh, the origins of this narrative are complex. They do grow out of Taiwan's own uh, domestic discourse and some issues uh, of past friction in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, but they are uh, actively promoted uh, and amplified uh, by an active uh, propaganda campaign conducted by the government of the People's Republic of China. Um, so uh, I do not want to take up too much time, uh, but uh, we will be having a discussion of two reports today. I'll be giving a presentation on the GTR report uh, for which I was the author. We also have with us today uh, Mr. Zerhao Yu, who is the co-director of the uh, Information Environment Research Center, uh, still operating under the old acronym IORG uh, in Taiwan, who will be discussing the uh, IORG report uh, that has been released. And I think uh, uh, while these two reports are separate and they were performed uh, separately by each organization, I think they're complementary uh, in nature. Um, I know the uh, the GTR report, the mentor which I was the author, is much more narrative and case study post, I think. Uh, whereas the report um, from IORG is very data driven and I think quantitative uh, in nature in terms of, of analyzing this uh, this issue. And so I, I hope the two will be complementary uh, in sort of looking at this. Uh, issue from different perspectives or with different uh, methodologies. Um, we also have two uh, very distinguished speakers to discuss uh, aspects of this. And I'll give each speaker sort of a more detailed introduction when it's their turn to speak. Uh, but we're very honored to have with us today Dr. Uh, Lee Wei Ping, a, a former journalist and, uh, uh, and PhD in journalism who uh, researches uh, issues related to disinformation and, and Taiwan's uh, media environment. As well as Mr. Benjamin Sando, who will be joining us uh, remotely over a, a link uh, from Taiwan, who is currently, uh, well, in addition to being a, a graduate student at Georgetown University, he's a current research fellow uh, with the Development Lab, a, another uh, civil society organization in Taiwan that also looks at uh, issues related to, uh, to propaganda and, uh, and disinformation. Uh, I'd like to give a, 
a special note, I think we have prizes due to uh, Mr. Yu for traveling the farthest uh, for anyone uh, to be with us uh, here today, having come from Taiwan, uh, as well as a special note of thanks uh, to Mr. Sando uh, for joining us at a very civilized hour, uh, starting this at, uh, at 11 p.m. Uh, Taiwan time uh, at the end of a very long day. So, so special notes and thanks uh, to, the, to the two of you there. Um, so this format will be, I think, fairly standard uh, for a think tank discussion. I think each uh, speaker has a, a presentation. Uh, we will then to speak for 10 to 15 minutes, maybe with some flexibility uh, on the time. Uh, and then after that, we will go to a, a Q&A and a moderated discussion. Uh, I'm going to violate the usual format just a little bit, I guess, by being both speaker uh, and moderator. Uh, but I will try to keep my own uh, introduction uh, relatively brief uh, so that, that we can then turn uh, to the uh, uh, comments of our, of our panelists. Um, a final note uh, to those who are watching this uh, online or through the stream, I uh, wanted to remind you that you too are part of this uh, uh, conversation. So uh, when we get to the Q&A, if you have questions you would like to uh, address to the panelists, you may do so either by placing those in the uh, those questions in the YouTube chat window, or by emailing them uh, to the email address uh, contact at globaltaiwan.org. Okay, again, contact at globaltaiwan.org. Uh, a final note uh, for those watching uh, through the stream: uh, I think we have put the URLs for both reports, both my PTR report and for the Iowa review report. Uh, the URLs have been placed in the YouTube chat window uh, as well, if you, if you wish to access them. And both reports are now available on each organization's uh, website uh, as well. Uh, so I think without further ado, uh, I will give my own presentation, again, trying to keep it relatively brief so it's not to hog all the time, and then turn it over to the, uh, to the real experts that we have. Do you have my, my brief? Ready? Okay. You go ahead and go to the first one. Uh, so, whoops. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so, again, the uh, the ETR report is titled uh, Chinese uh, Information Operations uh, America's Skepticism Theory and Banded Chess Piece. Um, and I'll, I'll take those one by one. So, the, the overall rubric. Of America's skepticism theory. Uh, as I said, this is sort of a, a narrative or a set of narratives that has become uh, more prominent in Taiwan's information space um, in the, uh, the last year or the last uh, handful of years. Um, the, uh, the, the Mandarin term, uh, you may look, uh, could actually be translated a few different ways. Uh, I chose to translate it as American skepticism. Theory. I think in the Iowa review report, we'll see it uh, referred to as U.S. skepticism. Um, and it, it should be translated some other ways too. Uh, the, uh, the, the E of that you may link could also perhaps mean doubt, suspicion, something like that. But just a, a sort of a general indication of, uh, of distrust or, or unreliability. Um, now, this theory, or uh, well, this narrative, I should say, um, it plays off some past legacies of, of U.S. Taiwan frictions, uh, such as the 1979 switch of diplomatic recognition from the Republic of China to the People's Republic of China. Um, more recent events played into it, too. Uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and the collapse of the Afghan government is, is a major element that's often played up within the, the narratives of American skepticism theory. Uh, and you'll see that um, uh, discussed in a bit more detail in the report. Um, but there are a few key elements of it. Uh, one thing I think is important to note about uh, American skepticism theory, you may learn, it usually depicts Taiwan as sort of having no agency of its own, as sort of a, a, a state sort of at the mercy uh, of other, other countries. Uh, around it. Uh, and I identify sort of four, what I identify anyway, as four key elements of America's skepticism theory. Uh, the first being that America is deceitful and treacherous. Uh, the second being that Taiwan uh, is being exploited as a tool of U.S. schemes to contain China. 
Uh, and it, it sort of presents or often depicts Taiwan in that way. And so uh, rules out in the sense that there could be, for example, some ideological affinity uh, between the United States and Taiwan as fellow democracies uh, within this set of narratives against Taiwan is, is simply uh, a tool that's being manipulated uh, by the United States in its conflict with China. Uh, the third element is that America is going to eventually abandon Taiwan uh, when it suits US interest to do so. Uh, and then the fourth element that because of all this, that it, it's in the best interest of Taiwan to uh, seek out uh, an accommodation uh, with the with the PRC, or at the very least, sort of uh, seek a neutral stance uh, between the two sides. Um, and I argue in our report uh, that uh, that this is part of, of an active Chinese state propaganda campaign. I do not argue that all of this was completely generated. Uh, by the Chinese Communist Party propaganda, and it does play off of uh, existing discourse uh, within Taiwan, uh, but that there is a, an active uh, Chinese government-directed propaganda campaign to sort of to promote and amplify this narrative as a way of trying to drive a wedge in uh, in U.S.-Taiwan relations. Next slide, um, a central element. Uh, that, that I identify or discuss in the report anyway is uh, Taiwan as you know, the, the abandoned chess piece, which is a, a key part of this narrative uh, that will be repeated uh, uh, over and over again. Various uh, news articles, propaganda materials, and so forth. Um, this narrative, or sort of a parallel narrative, I guess I should say, uh, depicts Taiwan as a, a chess piece or cheese of. Uh, that is being uh, used by the United States in its uh, uh, rivalry with China. Uh, that term Xinza is used a lot, as well as the term uh, Ma uh, which is a little bit awkward to translate the record, but it's pawn in front of the hoops, a pawn before the hoops, from a kind of set chess system of the Shanxi set. Um, in, in this narrative, or this parallel narrative, uh, America is, is sometimes identified directly, sometimes it's vaguely alluded to as a powerful country that is trying to uh, make Taiwan into a chess piece. You see that that theme uh, and that language repeated uh, over and over. Um, you can also see associated with it sometimes with the word chizu and chess piece, and it can be associated as well with chizu, uh, almost. Um, Almost uh, the same pronunciation, but with a different tone, meaning like this, um, a discarded or abandoned thing. But they're, they're both going towards the, the same meaning that the Taiwan is sort of a, a manipulated proxy of the United States that will be uh, abandoned uh, when it suits your centers to the same. Um, as I said, the report that I wrote is largely uh, narrative focus and, and case study focused, trying to provide examples. Uh, of this discourse uh, from both uh, traditional and online media uh, and both against from the CRC uh, as well as from uh, in Taiwan. Uh, what the graphic you see on the screen are a couple of images I pulled from a, uh, a Chinese a PRC uh, state uh, media news video uh, pushing the, the, the chess piece narrative. And the, the Chinese characters you see at the bottom of the screen uh, translate to, you know, as Taiwan scholars sharply point out, in the eyes of America, Taiwan is a chess piece, and any time to become a discarded and sacrificed chess piece. That word sacrifice, she sounds, is often used quite a bit uh, in conjunction with discussion of the chess piece uh, as well. Let's go to the next one. Oh, just one more example of that we can see uh, discussed in the report. Um, this is a uh, uh, from CCTV Chinese State Television. Uh, this is a, a a news segment featuring an interview uh, with an academic uh, from Taiwan, a professor at Yu Zixiang, a faculty member of the Shenzhen University, uh, titled "Taiwan Youth Don't Want to Be Pawns of Taiwan Independence Politicians," and it is using again some of that key language. Uh, it, it's using the pawn before the horse language, the, the ma chen's. I think. And in the uh, the commentary, um, I wanted to cite this or point it out um, as as an example of one of the methods that are used uh, in this Chinese state uh, propaganda campaign. They will sort of take 
uh, figures from sort of the, the relatively marginal uh, pro unification spectrum of Taiwan politics and amplify their messages and try to present them as being a reflection of a broader mainstream opinion uh, within Taiwan. Let's go to the next slide. Um, here I have just a couple more examples of how the, uh, the chess piece narrative in particular uh, has played out in recent uh, political discourse uh, in Taiwan. And the uh, image in at the top, um, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, Zhao Shaofeng, he's a, uh, a prominent media commentator in Taiwan um, sort of a, a firebrand political commentator. Um, some people uh, call him uh, Taiwan's Tucker Carlson. Um, but um, this is from uh, an interview in, in early January where he was criticizing uh, the Bolinda and people allegedly being too pro American uh, in its policies. And he said this in his media interview. It was a woman now I'm capable of uh, saying to America, I'm not on the chess piece. The chess piece narrative or a metaphor. Has cropped up um, in a number of other cases. And again, I, I cite some of these um, in, the, in the report. But just one of the examples at the bottom is uh, an excerpt from a speech uh, given by the, the current KMT presidential candidate uh, on New Year's Day. Uh, said, uh, where he said in the speech, amidst the Ukraine war and US China competition, if Taiwan cannot stay involved or, or off side, uh, but we are absolutely not a powerful country's chess piece. Again, using <coughs> Chang Wu, powerful country, as it seems that language to see repeated over and over again as part of this narrative. So this uh, this language has sort of seeped in to uh, political discourse uh, in, uh, in, in mainstream political discourse um, in Taiwan. <laughs> um, uh, on this slide, I provide uh, just a couple more examples um, that are, are cited in and discussed in the report of how uh, proxy figures are used um, as part of, again, what, what I identify as a, a Chinese government-driven uh, propaganda campaign, and one that uses uh, proxy figures uh, in Taiwan. Um, in the example at the top, um, it is a, an image taken from a TikTok video um, of an interview with uh, Ho Han Ping, who is a, a city council member in Taipei. And at least as far as I was able to tell from our research, I think he's the only member of the, the new party of the Xindang to actually hold any sort of prominent elected office in Taiwan. But the, the Xindang is a sort of a marginal pro unification uh, party in Taiwan. Um, and in this interview, uh, Ho was speaking to uh, elements uh, that you see um, repeated over and over again in Chinese Communist Party narratives about America, and particularly uh, presenting the argument that uh, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan were actually part of an American plot to lure Taiwan and the PRC into war uh, in order to weaken China and America's interests. Uh, yeah, sort of a very uh, long-standing. Uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, narrative. And members of the new party, you'll see them sort of pop up repeatedly as proxy figures. Uh, or, again, as I argue, the Chinese uh, uh, are well giving messages that align very closely with Chinese government. Um, the other example uh, that I had at the bottom is again one that I profile uh, in the report uh, from February of this year, uh, where on the Facebook accounts of a of Saitongan, a, a former uh, KMT legislator who uh, posted on his Facebook site uh, this series of slides and commentary. It's called the Seven Laws of U.S. Diplomacy. Um, and in the report, I discussed this as an example of what I believe is sort of CTP or PRC propaganda laundering, that they will prepare materials that are then presented by a proxy. Uh, as if this was original material made by the proxy. Uh, and uh, for this, this particular bit of material, um, Chinese state press actually had Ryan Arthas sort of praising this as very clever uh, original satirical material uh, produced by its time. Uh, but if you look at, uh, actually for both of these examples, uh, for those who can read Chinese, you'll see in both cases 
the, the text that appears within the exact is in simplified characters, the simplified characters that are used uh, in the PRC rather than the traditional characters more widely employed uh, in Taiwan, uh, which it's kind of sloppy. It's like not even making that much of an effort to, to hide uh, where this material uh, actually comes from. It's kind of lazy. Uh, but um, go on to the next slide. Uh, and this I'll just mention very quickly. Uh, also, as I discussed in the report, I have a section on uh, what I identify as sort of associated narratives or sub narratives of, of America. The idea that America is using Taiwan's atrocity to contain China, to claim the China authority. Uh, sub narrative pair two identified here with the criticisms. Uh, made of uh, the Democratic Progressive Party, Thomas Party, uh, for the sort of sellouts to America. Uh, sub narrative three uh, that the US military commitments beat, and also within that, I discuss uh, sort of narratives from Afghanistan or assertions that uh, the collapse of Afghanistan indication that America will not provide any meaningful support for Taiwan, uh, as well as criticisms of alarm sales uh, as being sort of an overpriced junk. You know, like America is so selling fast off equipment. I want is basically the idea there. Uh, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of political cartoons uh, from Chinese state propaganda outlets. I, I love them to death. Uh, Uncle Sam is always up to something nefarious. Uh, so you can see here how Uncle Sam is pushing Tsai Ing Wen to buy a junkie, uh, cast off uh, American guns. And you can also see Uncle Sam getting ready for a fight match. Uh, to start off with war in the Asia, in, in the lower left. Um, and uh, as, as these, uh, some of these narratives or sub narratives get more extreme, uh, they lead up to the point where there's a, a, a thread um, in these propaganda narratives now that America actually has an active plan to destroy Taiwan. The American plan to destroy mm -hmm. Taiwan is something that you, you've seen in other sources. And actually, I believe I don't want to steal any thunder. I think there are elements of that discussed in the, the title of the report uh, as well. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time. So I'm going to conclude there um, just by saying that um, uh, while well, some of the elements of, of this uh, must be a bit outlandish, I, I think it is true that American skepticism has come to occupy uh, actually a common place. In, uh, in Taiwan's uh, domestic discourse. I think some of the other speakers who will speak to that in more detail, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, for, for example. Um, but while uh, I think a lot of this is, uh, again, does grow out of uh, indigenous uh, political discourse or domestic political discourse in Taiwan, it is being very actively amplified and promoted. Uh, by the CCP propaganda system, and I would argue by co opted individuals associated with that system uh, in, in Taiwan as a means to drive a wedge uh, between the United States and Taiwan. Uh, so I'm going to conclude my own uh, part uh, there, and I don't want to go over on time. Uh, I want to turn next to our <coughs> other speakers, and particularly next to uh, Mr. Mew. Uh, let me give you a proper introduction here. Uh, we are lucky to have with us today, uh, Mr. Zhihao Yu. Um, he is a, a software engineer and information designer and the co-director of the Taiwan Information Environment Research Center, uh, formerly the Information Operations Research Group for IORG, uh, based in, uh, in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, Mr. Yu coordinates scientific research, data engineering, community engagement, and international exchange uh, for his organization. Uh, and directing their capacity towards safeguarding election integrity and building uh, greater democratic resilience <laughs> in Taiwan. Uh, Mr. Yu is also a contributor to, I'm going to mangle this, Gov0, G0B, yeah, to Gov0, uh, a, a civic hacking community in Taiwan, uh, as well as uh, an organizer facing the ocean, a West Pacific uh, civic hacking network. So, I, uh, Mr. Yu, I will uh, turn the floor to you soon. Thank you for having me. 
John. Thank you, Fisher guys. I'm not sure if it sounds okay. It's not. It's, um, hi, everyone. I'm Zhi Hao. Uh, I'm from Taiwan. Uh, I work at uh, IOIG, which is now stands for Taiwan Information Environment Research Center, or Taiwan Zhijun Huan Jing and Zhou Zhongshu. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, our report, U.S. Skepticism Narratives, and where they come from. Um, I'm going to apologize uh, now uh, for saying the word skepticism too many times. <laughs> it's a very difficult word to pronounce. So uh, you have to excuse me for that. Um, you can scan for the QR code uh, for the full report. It's pretty long. Uh, I also apologize for that. Um, but you can also just go on our website, iorg.tw. Um, it's the first link on the homepage. Um, also, the slide deck today is also public. You can access with this tiny URL here. Um, Oh, and it's going to be remain possible, so you don't have to take photos or anything. You just want the content of the slide deck. Okay. Um, next slide, please. So, as I was saying, um, I'm working at Taiwan Information Environment Research Center. We started in 2019 in Taiwan. We are currently a group of uh, social scientists and data engineers. Um, uh, we work at various issues that are related to Taiwan's information environment, that includes online platforms as well as traditional news media and uh, web forms. Um, next slide, please. So we are uh, very concerned about how uh, Taiwanese information environment is progressing. Um, our past research has indicated that. Um, it's getting harder and harder for people to talk about public issues on the internet. So we're, we're very concerned about that, especially for myself growing up with the internet and having sort of um, aspirations about how internet can be a uh, force for good for democracy. Now it's um, a lot of indications saying it's the opposite. So uh, we're conducting data driven research and as well as uh, traditional social science research to fig figure out um, what are the problems in our information environment and what can we do about it. Next slide, please. Um, our biggest research tool is what we call the RRG Information Environment Archive, um, currently focused on Mandarin information. So we collect a lot of data from all of these platforms that you see. Um, uh, currently, our system processes around uh, 12 million documents every day, including text and video content as well. So we use that uh, big archive to do our research. Um, in looking at uh, various events and various topics in our information environment, uh, we use the star large data set to, to identify uh, important topics for the big circle. And then the big circle has topic, for example, uh, Fukushima nu uh, nuclear wastewater as a topic that's pretty specific. Also, U.S. skepticism is a very large topic. So topics can be large and or small. Um, and the topic is defined by a very large group of content, right, documents, right? whether it's Facebook posts, news media articles, YouTube videos, TikTok videos, so on and so forth. Um, within that group of documents, the topic we can use traditional mechanisms or but also AI powered tools to identify narratives in our in our data set. And that's how we do our research. That's why we can comfortably say that it's a data driven research. Um, okay, and with this uh, sort of process, you identify topic and the trend of the topic. For example, when is a certain topic popular amongst Taiwanese people or when is it not? And uh, you, when we identify narrative, we also see the behavior of this narrative, saying that who is talking about this narrative and who is impacting with what uh, content. And that's what uh, our research can also show. And at the atomic level of this research method, it's the documents, like the posts, the reports, the, the articles. And uh, with that, you also see sort of the actors who published what, who, and 
plan are also important in our report. So next slide, please. I hope that was like a brief but clear enough uh, explanation of how we do what we do. So we have skepticism. So uh, it's important to specify the range of the time looking into this uh, uh, topic. So it's 2021 all the way to June this year, 2022. And then we identify all these are you know, more or less connected to Taiwan-US relations, but some of them less so, some of them more so. Um, and we identify 84 narratives, 84 concrete narratives from actual documents that are spreading in our information environment um, that we categorize as U.S. skepticism. Uh, we, we have a working definition of the term U.S. skepticism, as John if you have skepticism theory, you might look. Um, it's unreasonable narrative claiming that I want to keep its distance or, or in a way reduce our cooperation our relationship with the U.S. And uh, we further categorize the group, the, the 84 narratives into eight types, which we'll get, get into in a moment. And then some characteristics. So next slide, please. Um, the, these are the 12 events. Um, this is nine of them because I don't want to make the next too small, so we'll see another three. These are events we identified um, in 2021 and 2022. And then from each box, you'll see like an example narrative of what we found for that event. For example, um, the first one, during 2021, when Taiwan, uh, when COVID got serious in Taiwan, we are short of vaccines. So there were examples about, uh, it's a pretty crude translation. Thursday buys weapon, Sunday gifted vaccine. Zhou si mai email, sorry, Zhou si mai wu qi zhou, zhou ri song email. It connects two non necessarily connected events. Like one is Taiwanese government approved budget for uh, US arm sales, and the other one is US gifting for the uh, Moderna vaccines to Taiwan. So that, was what, that was one of the examples. That was one of the example narratives we found related to the, the vaccine. Um, for more crazy ones, TSM CEO expansion incident towards the end of last year. We're looking at all the narratives related to TSMC last year. And one of them, for uh, example, here, number 56, the US will expect TSMC engineers implement scorched earth policy and destroy Taiwan. That's pretty out there, but we did, uh, did see that spreading in tone. In various um, next slide, please. These are three events uh, from, the, from the first half of this year. Um, of course, uh, our president signed one visited, transited his quest um, in April to talk about how Taiwan's visit will bring about war. One. And um, one of the longer analysis that we did was about the supply shortages. Uh, that is talking about a shortage of electricity, water, eggs, chicken eggs, um, medicine, and meat, mainly pork. Um, so those are supposed to be very domestic uh, everyday life issues, but somehow also linked uh, to Taiwan-US relations. They're traditionally with the propagandists, or some of them are actually related to that um, For example, this one, number 83, says that uh, Taiwanese people can eat meat, can eat eggs, our government is cooperating with the U.S. plan to destroy Taiwan, making people eat bombs. Again, these are all very crude explanation of our translation from the actual documents. Um, okay, so I hope that uh, so that was the 12 events from 2021 to the first half of the next. So these are the eight types. Um, so these we come, came up with ourselves, and you will immediately see that the first type abandonment, which uh, is very connected to what John was saying about the abandoned chess piece uh, narrative. Um, um, so you see these eight types, and four of them are addressing the U.S.-Taiwan relations. 
for the relationship between Amazon and UI. Even four of them are addressing the UI itself. Like those are two different things that different narratives can address to. Um, um, for the four types that are addressing US, sorry, Taiwan US relations, we're talking about the US as a fake friend that will abandon Taiwan. Uh, the US is colluding with Taiwanese elites that will ultimately destroy Taiwan. That is the characterization of this uh, narrative on US Taiwan relations. Um, or the four types that are addressing the US itself, talking about the US, how the US is weak, um, it cannot defend Taiwan, or bring it about uh, chaos in the world, not only in trade. Talking about how the US is not, is not a which was turned into but picked up by, by these narratives. And uh, its action is uh, being opposed by a lot of countries in the world, including for the uh, itself. So these states might, you know, we'll go into more detail later on in the final step of how these state types also correspond or uh, resonate with other ERC propaganda that are not US skeptical. Uh, we think that correspondence is very important. Um, next slide, please. So we're data people, so we like to do these like, very difficult to understand tables. <laughs> um, so basically, the <laughs> these are the 12 events, right? So from 2021, first half of this year. The horizontal axis is eight types. And the numbers just uh, is the numbers for each narrative, so one to 84. And the, the color coding is the interesting part, right? Um, we first want to look at who are talking about these narratives as opposed to our data set. So whenever a narrative, which is a group of documents, whenever that group of documents contains something from the PRC state media, state agency, or affiliated media, or you know, one, one, one of their ambassadors, we color code, we designate it to be a PRC amplified narrative. Whenever it's not, it's not a PRC amplified narrative. So we'll, we color code this data with that methodology. And you'll see most of these narr narratives are red, right? Meaning that most of these narratives have received certification from the PRC outlets. Um, some of them are blue, which means that according to our data set, at least, they, these narratives are not amplified by the PRC, which is also a very interesting behavior to analyze. So we'll, and talk about. We also did find some sort of PRC plus Russian official um, amplifications together on some narratives that are the, that those are the underlying narratives, 35 and 37, um, which can be an interesting thing to um, Okay, so that is the, that is narrative answer. And then uh, next slide, narrative creation. So very different color. Right? Um, so the red one again created by PRC outlet, so the blue one uh, created by Taiwanese actors. So we need to first of all remind ourselves the distinction. The PRC actors are state sponsored, or state backed, or state controlled. All the Taiwanese actors are not. They are civil, civilian, or private media. So very different from the start and go. Color coding. Um, so the red PRC, the pink Chinese, meaning that we can't find any concrete evidence that these outlets are connected to the PRC state or PRC, but still their Chinese origin. Um, the orange one, a Russia state, on the uh, yellow, Malaysian, and then blue Taiwan. So we see this graph looks pretty different from the last one, which is this one is very blue. Meaning that according to our data set, a lot of these narratives are created by Taiwanese actors, but they're just amplified by PRC actors with the uh, new version of the last one. Next slide, please. So from these data evidence, we can sort of include some things. I'm hoping more from your expertise. One is that the PRC amplifies while Taiwanese actors create something that we can or conclude from the data. From the data. Um, and the second one, we can look at 
what are the tires um, that each of these uh, glucose actors like to play. And we found uh, for PLC actors, they like to play fake friend narrative and collusion narratives. Saying again, that the US is a fake friend that is polluting the sacrifice balance, evolve or destroy power, whatever. And while the Taiwanese actors like like and is a very I think it's more fake word, but let's say it, um, like to create collusion narratives, payoff narratives, and abandonment narratives. Again, the US is promoting the Taiwan elites, the US is creating chaos in the world, and the US is abandoned. Okay. So that that those are the things that the data tell. And we can further interpret the data uh, to provide these two companies. Over the years, you see the development of US narrative, US, US skepticism narrative um, towards conflict. So, for example, in 2021, a lot of the narratives you see are abandoning Taiwan and using Taiwan. Um, but then, towards 2022 and 2023, a more narrative talk, talk about the destruction. I think signals a rising tension, um, either in our region or in the minds of the propagandists they want to exploit. Um, another thing that we are also interested in is, is why are Taiwanese actors creating and amplifying these narratives to us at the same time? And we, our conclusion are four things. Um, from, from the fact that Taiwanese actors pollute us, create the most collusion narratives, we think that it's due to how due to the polarizing partisanship in Taiwanese society. And from the fact that Taiwanese actors create a lot of chaos narratives, we think that it speaks to a recognition of US global power and uh, the presence of war anxiety in Taiwanese society. Last, um, Taiwanese actors create a lot of abandonment narratives of which we think Talks about a existing collective orphan mentality, which uh, John was also talking a little bit about. about um, an example would be the US switch of diplomatic recognition from the ROC to the PRC in the 70s. Uh, we further argue that this sort of orphan mentality might be even more rooted in our society due to the 400 year, roughly 400 year of colonial, colonial uh, history. So yeah, those are the very brief uh, conclusions that we want to present today. And finally, I want to talk about the pairing between high of U.S. skepticism and other PRC propaganda that are not U.S. not are that are not explicitly anti-U.S. So next slide. So you know, uh, type A and type B talks about U.S. is a fake friend and will abandon and sort of complementary. Or to complement that, or to complement, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, China is the real family and has come to Taiwan's aid. So examples include in 2021, uh, Chinese propaganda talks a lot about how China wants and are providing vaccines to Taiwan and overseas Taiwanese. Um, and these two one is US skepticism, one is non US skepticism, PRC propaganda. They, we argue that these two together sort of combines and creates a more complete worldview for Mandarin speakers that might work convincing. We present four very uh, here. One of them we talked about, and the second one is type E and type H. We have to lose the Taiwanese elite or destroy Taiwan. Here with that, yeah, she probably going to talk about how the PPP government, the current Taiwanese government, is perverse. Um, so this is a, our translation, the 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 that wording is Dao Xing Ni Shi and sells out Taiwanese people. Um, you find more examples in the full version of the The next slide. And I B, I B and N talk about US weak and not a democracy at the same time. The RC propaganda is talking about China is powerful, military, economically, and truly democratic. They have this probably saying it wrong, but 
four bronzes, eight black holes, three black holes, two black holes. Thank you. And then lastly, um, type B and type G talk about the U.S. source of chaos in the world and acts unilaterally. Again, sometimes true. Um, at the same time, propaganda talks about a PRC propaganda talks about China is the defender of the world order, and wait to away who to whatever use and promote the democratization of global governance. And there are two the UN to the national uh, organization talk about the naming new content, the shared destiny, common humankind. Okay, <laughs> so that's the last thing I want to talk about talk to you about today. Um last, last slide. And then again, we use data science to talk about information manipulation in our environment. Right? We're now calling for partners. Um, you want to use our data in your research. You want to develop the archive with us. Um, you are very welcome to email hi at IRG.data. Um, the full report, again, is on our website um, for listening. Uh, Jerhal, thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, summary of, uh, of your report. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, um, I think the IORP uh, report's uh, approach is, is very data-driven. I think you, you can see there. I think my, my own report is, is quite lazy in, uh, in, in comparison, involving uh, a few months of work. Uh, I think you can see uh, uh, years of work uh, going into that one. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Jerhal. Um, I'd like to turn next to Dr. Wiking Lee uh, for her uh, comments uh, on the reports and on Donald's uh, information on the current state of it. Um, uh, Dr. Lee earned her PhD uh, from the University of Maryland's uh, Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Uh, her research interests include propaganda, uh, social media content moderation, and digital privacy challenges. Uh, prior to entering academia, uh, she was also a consultant in the field of digital human rights. Uh, she has also uh, worked as a, a journalist uh, in Taiwan uh, in a variety of media outlets. Uh, and uh, Dr. Lee received uh, also her uh, uh, law degree, her Master of Laws, from the University of Pennsylvania Law School uh, and was admitted to the uh, New York State Bar as an attorney uh, to practice in, uh, in 2009. So quite a, a renaissance woman. <laughs> Uh, but Dr. Lee, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Okay, uh, my name is Wei Ping Lee, and I'm a researcher focusing on conspiracy theory, propaganda, and um, disinformation, and how these problematic information affect Taiwan, especially Taiwan's um, news media. Um, I want to thank you, uh, thank you, John and the GTI for inviting me to this uh, very uh, inspiring, very exciting discussion about um, American skepticism theory. Um, I also want to say want to thank you too for the privileges and let me read the address. Um, so um, my comments will be divided into two parts. For the first part, I would over my feedback on this two reports. And for the second part, I am to try um, to approach this topic from the angle of Taiwan media So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I want to start with the GTI report, just report. I don't agree with you, that that's a lazy word. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I think um, this report to offer um, very good um, uh, good encapsulation of the sentiment, the scope, and the definition of American skepticism. And this report also offers um, some important instances for us to understand the substance of this, um, this theory. And it's, a good starting point for us, for those who are interested in this phenomenon, um, to um, to explore. And uh, um, also, I think your report offer um, some very useful um, background information about the history 
to the roots of other ideologies of American skepticism theory, and it's quite um, helpful for me as well. I'm not familiar with the Taiwan or some historical um, information. Um, also, uh, when I when I was reading this um, report, I was also I was also intrigued by um, the question that uh, how is the skepticism theory reflected on um, one's media? I mean, not only those media which are for China, but also for media overall. Are there other uh, media who unwisely, unwittingly promote this kind of theory? Um, or are, are, do they have any resistance to this kind of uh, skepticism? So I think um, your report uh, can inspire a lot of further research on this topic. Um, and for IORG's report, um, thank you for all this hard work. I really like the categorization of the narratives. I think that the eight types of narratives are really useful. And the more we further research to type in, and um, I also like that you combine these narratives with um, the amplifiers and the behaviors and you know, try to find which party will uh, be kind of to prevent or to create um, what kind of types. Um, and, uh, but I also think I'm, I'm very interested in um, how um, IORG um, define creators and buyers. And, so how to confirm if this message is this information was really very first created by by some organizations you know uh, because in our information study area it's always a very vaccine um, very vaccine problem question for us because it's really hard to confirm who is the community information? And excuse me, so right here, I will try in um, my observations um, on the Taiwanese media environment. And if there are um, opportunities and the challenges for Taiwanese media to counter uh, skepticism theory. So, next slide, please. So, um, for me, um, I want to define American skepticism theory as conspiracy theories. Um, so conspiracy theories are about statements which says there are powerful groups or individuals behind the events um, who try to exploit others for their own goods. And conspiracy theories are usually years in the making. It's not just a fact about a certain time, it's at, uh, it's actually booming. I've been meaning for a long time, in fact, and it combines with ideologies, combined with some myth, with rumors, with with um, people's identities, and it's, and of course, yes, there are some facts in the conspiracy theories. So it makes um, conspiracy theories so hard to counter, and it. As I said, it, it will be moving in the background, but at some time, at a turbulent time, it will just pop out and it become prevalent. Um, so from this point of view, for American skepticism, I think it, it quite fits into the category of conspiracy theories because American skepticism argue that uh, the United States are going to exploit Taiwan for their own goods and they will abandon or even destroy Taiwan at some point. And um, as uh, GTS report in the annual report I pointed out, they have some um, historical roots and uh, it also resonated with some Taiwanese identities or ideologies and also some. Um, some very um, troubling events in the past. Uh, and now at this moment, Taiwan is faced with the growing stress from China 
and a very uncertain um, relationship, um, Taiwan, China, even the United States, and people want to predict what will be in the future. So this is the timing where the American skepticism theory become prevalent in um, Taiwan. So next slide, please. So here is a very um, simple illustration about the Taiwan's media environment and the high information flow from information creators to audiences. So um, for the information creators, especially this, this information creators, um, in addition to uh, the Chinese entities that these two reports mentioned, there are also Taiwanese actors who act as information creators. Um, but, you know, in, in a democratic country, uh, in a democratic society, there will always be this, this information. There will always be creators and suppliers of this information conspiracy theories. We don't have to worry too much if we have a robust media system and the responsible media outlet. Um, but what we are facing here in Taiwan, the problem is that um, we are not sure if our media outlets could be safeguards or the amplifiers of this conspiracy series and this information. So um, I want to take you to have a quick look at the Taiwanese media environment right now. Um, slide, please. So, um, this is uh, a, a research conducted by Professor Lin Li at the National Taiwan University. She collaborates with um, our Reuters Institute. And uh, according to her research, um, so this is how Taiwanese people receive information. So as you can see that 75% of Taiwanese people receive information from online media, including websites and uh, um, social media, and still there are 56% of Taiwanese receive information from traditional TV news. So we still cannot ignore the influence of the Taiwan um, TV news. Um, so next, please. And uh, talking about the online media, um, as we can see from this um, image, uh, Yahoo News, um, is the most popular um, information source. Yahoo News is actually a news aggregator, news portal, which um, have a, display a lot of um, news pieces from different news outlets. And uh, um, so Yahoo News is followed by ET News, ET Today News, and TPS News, and Divine News, um, another news aggregator. Is also the main source of the Taiwanese people um, using information. So what 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 do these images tell us? Um, so next please. How many here can see some challenges? Um, the Taiwanese media to become the safeguards against the disinformation conspiracy theories. So the first of challenge is that Taiwanese media could be problematic the information creators and the buyers. So, um, I don't know if you are aware that a very recent news that there is um, news published by United Daily News saying that um, the United States are trying to push Taiwan to develop new uh, bioweapons and to establish people laboratories in Taiwan. And this news is unverified and it has been debunked by several credible uh, fact-checking initiatives in Taiwan and in Asia. So this is totally not true, um, but it's created by you know, Taiwan is news outlet, United States News. So, um, so this is an example that Taiwan news media could be a creator of um, this information. Um, second, please. Next, please. Uh, so the uh, second challenge is that um, now we are faced with a very fragmented um, media environment. So which means that um, it's algorithms which decide what we can see um, in our uh, 
news sources, as I mentioned before, Yahoo News and Line News, uh, Line Today, has become the main sources of Taiwan news, uh, news information. And it's the algorithm to decide that what audience could see. And um, sometimes they are good information, but most of the times they are very trivial information which could not offer useful information for audiences, and even sometimes create fatigue among the new, uh, among audiences. Um, so that's things. And the third um, challenge is that the Taiwanese media actually don't have robust media practices. If you are interested in Taiwanese Taiwanese media's news article, you can see that most of them are very short articles, which fail to provide um, background information or to put this information in contextual, uh, in context. So, which means that it's very hard if you want to use this information to combat conspiracy theories, because as I mentioned, conspiracy theory has combined with um, there's historical events, rumors, uh, rumors, myths. If you want to combat this kind of information, you have to have another narratives which are um, put into context and it can convince audiences and rebut this um, very problematic information. But Chinese media, um, I haven't seen a lot of them doing this. So next, please. So as a result, the Chinese people actually don't have a lot of uh, trust in Chinese media. As you can see from this um, graphic, the trust the score is really low, 28 percent. And uh, so people actually sometimes they will just believe the media they want to believe, and uh, or to to go to the persons they think they can trust to as they were. Um, information sources um next please yeah and another thing is about online social media so we we the problem is that we don't know uh why we were seeing this content the algorithms on social media are really um, opaque and not transparent we for the past few years um we did see that social media companies help Taiwan to counter disinformation in elections. Um, but we still don't we still don't know how the algorithms are come up with. And uh, um, we now re rely on this social media's goodwill to help us. But we don't know if this kind of um, help will sustain, especially when there are changes in companies' policies or even personnel. So I think um, it's important that we we keep uh, monitoring um, the change of social media policies again with the social media environment. Um, next, please. So uh, my conclusions is that we have to uh, recognize that American skepticism theories are not only just a, a very uh, a few pieces of disinformation that to debunk. Actually, we are facing a formidable enemy and it's very hard to tackle and this and what we can do now is to improve our media practices and the media structures that's another for another seminar i want to go into there but what i want to say is that also i am somewhat pessimistic about the time of this environment but i do see some hopes because they are still very talented reporters very responsible um uh, media organizations trying to do um, in-depth investigative reporting. We need to support this um, news organizations and uh, give them more resources or make them more known to audiences. And uh, um, yes, so that's what you said. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, Weiping, thank you uh, very much uh, for that uh, that discussion. I think that the discussion of Taiwan's media environment certainly helps to put all this in, in much better context uh, for understanding. So thank you for that. I've um, jotted down a couple of questions I might have for you if we have time in the Q&A. 
uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll have time for that. Um, but uh, I do want to turn next to uh, our, our final speaker, uh, who once again very generously stayed up uh, uh, at an uncivilized hour uh, to uh, participate in our event today. And that's uh, Mr. Benjamin Sando, who is a, a current uh, MA student uh, in the Georgetown University School of uh, Foreign Service. Um, and he has been taking a little bit of a break uh, from his studies with Georgetown over the past year uh, to work as a, a research fellow with uh, Double Temple Lab, a civil society organization uh, in Taiwan dedicated to uh, strengthening Taiwan society's resilience against online disinformation uh, and malign Chinese influence operations. Uh, ben is also the current recipient of a, a GTI a scholarship to uh, support some of his, uh, his work there. Um, in addition to his work in, in Taiwan, uh, Ben has also previously worked and studied in Korea uh, as a research fellow with the uh, Yonsei Institute of, uh, of Sinology. Uh, but he has very generously offered to uh, share with us some of his uh, experiences or insights regarding uh, civil society responses to uh, disinformation. Uh, ben, once again, thank you. And I will turn the virtual floor over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, can you guys hear me? Maybe. John could give a thumbs up. Just one moment, please. Sure. Then go again. Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, man. Yes, go ahead. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, and also thank you for the audiences here and online. And uh, thank you, DTI, for putting my face up in front of everybody because it's pretty good for my ego. So I will turn to my slides that I will share. And I am just going to ask a friend who is tuning in online uh, whether or not, if I change my slide, whether she can see. So I'm just going to wait for notice because it has been a little bit of a lag online. And I'd like to know. Okay. Apparently she can hear me well. Maybe there's a bit of a lag. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll go in. I'll see uh, how it works. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk a little bit today, quite briefly, because I know a little bit over time on the civil society response to the America skepticism theory. Uh, we've heard from civil society actors here today, um, and I'd like to talk about this space broadly. Um, in addition to my work with Double Think Lab, I am a GTI Taiwan scholar, and I'm investigating this space. I'll write a report, and uh, which will be available for the end of this year. And I've done lots of field interviews to try to get a sense of what people are doing. So the most, most important question I need to answer right now is why am I here? Uh, why are we talking about, why do we examine Taiwanese civil society, especially in the context of the America skepticism theory? Well, from a normative perspective, it's a very vibrant space that's attracting a lot of attention from international observers and media, and it demonstrates Taiwanese's uh, Taiwanese people's embrace of their own liberal democracy contradic contradicting PRC narratives that, that Taiwan is simply a pawn of the US. It's also innovative. There's a broad uptake of uh, technology, including machine learning and AI, and also software tools to provide social good. And you've seen some of that today with Chahao's amazing IRG report. But most importantly, for the purposes of this discussion, we talk about Taiwanese civil society because it challenges PRC interference in ways that the Taiwanese government cannot. Now, this is not just some flaw of the Taiwanese government. This is a flaw of democratic governments everywhere. Um, and it's one of the reasons why democratic governments have been slow and ineffective in responding to information operations. Why is this? What are the shortcomings? One of these is that liberal societies don't allow their governments to be the arbiters of truth. So we don't allow our governments to decide what narratives are true and which are false, even if they run against the security of our own nations. 
We also don't allow governments to be the primary authors of news. So we cannot allow governments to provide us narratives which may be beneficial to our own security. And finally, governments often lack the legitimacy or the capacity to organize certain collective action. Um, okay, apparently there's some lag here. I hope my audio is okay at the very least, if not my, uh, my, yeah, if not my, uh, my slides. So, um, in, in every respect, these, um, civil society is able to make up for these shortcomings in a way that doesn't actually contradict with our liberal democratic norms, in fact, upholds them. Uh, and so how many societies that? Society that yeah. Can... Uh, just one uh, where the audio is not very good. We're going to see uh, if maybe if we go audio only with your connection, if that would improve the audio quality. Okay, I'm going to. Interesting. The, um, the online audiences are telling me my audio is okay. Um, but, and the, and the PowerPoint as well, no lagging. Okay. So you guys, I suppose you can't see my slides on from the, the audience, uh, in person. Uh, actually for the in-person audience, we can still see them. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, but go ahead then. Sure. Okay, so uh, what I've done is I've, I've roughly organized civil society activity into three areas, which I've called the three builds. And I just wanna say, if this sounds like a uh, party Congress slogan coming from a, from a Chinese Congress, uh, you know, party Congress, then I assure you that it's, that any similarity is purely coincidental. Um, so the first of these builds is about building a scrutiny of mis and disinformation. The second one is about building reliable sources of news on Taiwan. And the third activity is about building individual autonomy for Taiwanese. What do I mean by these? Firstly, there is a network of civil society organizations which are focused on blunting the effects of PRC information operations, either work done to amplify or create anti-American narratives. Uh, this activity includes fact checking, researching information operations, or promoting media literacy. Taiwan Fact Check Center, COFAX, MigoPen are very prominent in fact checking. IRG and Double Think Lab researching from information operations, and all to some extent engage in media literacy campaign. I'll say that if you're very interested in learning more about um, about fact checking as as an endeavor, I encourage you to read articles by Dr. Lee, who's here today, and Dr. Chowning Su, who is a uh, Taiwan scholar this year as well. Um, these articles are on the slides. If you can see them, if not, please, I can share these articles, these slides with you uh, later. There's a second activity. The second build is about building reliable sources of US Taiwan uh, news. Uh, the goal ben, I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Uh, my apologies. The audio connection is is very poor on this end. It's often cutting out. There's a lot of buffering. Uh, so my, my apologies to you. Um, I, I think we might go to the uh, the Q and A or start that discussion. I'm very sorry to to cut off your presentation. But I think we'd like to maybe get your slides and we could perhaps post them uh, afterwards. Uh, so my apologies, but yep. like the the connection is is very poor. Yep. Sure. Oh. Uh, but with that, uh, I guess I will go to uh, the uh, the Q and A and our discussion involving our, our audience, both uh, here in person uh, and uh, and online. Um, once again, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, watching the stream, I uh, have a question you present to the panelists. You can either do so by putting a question in the YouTube chat window or by emailing it to contact at global Taiwan. Uh, dot org, and we'll try to incorporate uh, some of those uh, questions uh, as well as those uh, from our live audience. Um, I think I'll uh, uh, take a moment to exercise the traditional 
uh, moderator's prerogative uh, to present a, uh, so a, a comment and question uh, to the panelists. Um, and I will say uh, for, in reading the IORT report, after I had uh, written my own report and then was uh, reading uh, the IORG report and then uh, uh, Wei Ping's uh, very detailed comments, which she very kindly uh, shared with us on those, it, uh, they were very helpful to me and actually caused me to rethink um, some of my own thoughts. Uh, you know, in the past, I've done research work about the Chinese state uh, propaganda system, and uh, I'm probably too comfortable swimming in that lane. And so when I began working on this topic, I, I sort of approached it uh, with that expectation or perspective. And I think one of the things that, again, the IORG report and Wei Ping's comments were very uh, helpful uh, for to me was making things more uh, about the extent to which uh, some of the things discussing may actually, you know, grow out of Taiwan's own uh, domestic discourse and then might be you know, played up or amplified uh, by uh, by other actors and by the, the Chinese state propaganda system. But so I wanted to uh, see if I could draw a little bit more uh, some of your thoughts or comments um, about this uh, question. Well, again, which is discussed in the, the IORG report uh, and that Wei Ping uh, commented on of sort of narrative creation versus amplification. Sort of like, who is it that's creating these narratives? And then from there, who is it that's uh, promoting them? Um, and, and perhaps uh, I, I, either if you wanted to take this example or use another one, uh, but in Wei Ping's uh, presentation uh, where she mentioned the, uh, the, the bio warfare lab, uh, disinformation story uh, that was in Taiwan media uh, recently. And uh, again, if you're not familiar with it, uh, the, over the past month, there was a story in, in Taiwan's media uh, that uh, sort of played up the idea uh, that the U.S. government uh, was sponsoring a biological warfare lab uh, in Taiwan. Um, and there were some documents, that, what seemed to be fake documents uh, that were sort of in support of the story of Taiwan government officials discussing this. Um, and again, either taking that story that started in the, the, the mobile, the United Daily News, or if there's another example you had in mind, I, I want to see if you, I could draw a little bit more any thoughts you had of the sort of the source of stories like that. Uh, you know, again, is it something generated within Taiwan? Uh, or are there, uh, in some instances, outlets in Taiwan that may be taking uh, PRC material and then sort of republishing it or promoting it. Or so, right, yeah, how, how do you see disinformation stories like that? So, like, what what, what do you see as being the, the origin or, or, or the source of those? If, I mean, if, if you can draw a clear conclusion, it's probably, it's probably a much uh, messier picture than that. But, uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? It's, it's indeed a very messy picture. Um, you know, as I said, it's really hard to. To be sure, a lot of readers. And my own research, because my dissertation is also about the COVID 19 origin. Who are, um, how, who are promoting this series and how they are transmitted in Taiwan? And I found that, um, of course, we cannot deny that some of this information might be from China. But some are actually um, brands rumors in 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 Taiwan, and and we need to further ask about the intention for those who are transmitted in Taiwan. Um, those sources are not necessarily meaning to promote this this information or to resonate with China. Sometimes they, they are just a very sloppy media practices. And this kind of sloppy media practice that they just grab some rumors and publish it online and, and contribute to the very big stream of disinformation. Um, so I, I also want to, um, to, to mention that um, I think to trace the very origin of the information creators, of course, is important, but we want to put more emphasis on those amplifiers. 
because they are the, um, for the most of part, they are the main contributor to the pervasiveness, let's face the interviews. All right, uh, let me uh, open up the uh, uh, Q&A to our audience. If any of the members of our audience have a, a question, uh, perhaps the, uh, the young lady in the back, could someone uh, get her a microphone? If I could ask you to uh, just introduce yourself uh, briefly and uh, speak your question. Sure, thanks. Thank you all. My name is Kirsten Astle. I work at a China-focused political risk advisory firm here in D.C. And I was wondering if you could speak more about the uh, America's skepticism narratives within the current election right now. You mentioned how you, I think, something about the chess piece comment, but how is it being applied or used between the different parties and candidates? Is it having an effect on the election right now? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll open that up to any of our panelists to, uh, uh, if you would like to comment on it. And actually, uh, Ben, can you hear us? Is our audio connection up and uh, working a little bit better now? I hope so. Yeah, I, I wonder if it can be heard now. I, we can hear yes, you we as well now. Uh, if you didn't hear the uh, question from the audience member, it was related to uh, the ways in which these sorts of narratives uh, may be playing out in the course of the current presidential campaign in Taiwan. Uh, but do uh, any of you, uh, any of the three panels, have, uh, have any uh, uh, thoughts or comments on that? And then he can do that. Uh, that neither of them will answer questions. Or then. Um, okay, so US skepticism is a context. Um, I think to put it very bluntly, uh, the US is. Taiwan is often perceived that the DPP is the U.S. supporter, while other parties argue that they want equal equilibrium between U.S. and China. Our politician in Taiwan that says this by himself. First of all, you don't have the credibility of that or the feasibility of so-called equilibrium. Taiwan in the middle, U.S. here, China there. Instance. Um, that's the feasibility of that. No, it's being proposed by politicians in Taiwan as alternative to uh, Taiwan being favorable or supporting the U.S. According, multiple polls still show that overall Taiwanese societies are pro. Taiwanese society is pro U.S. Uh, it's supporting U.S. Uh, it's uh, seeing U.S. as a more favorable 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 light than the PRC, um, but there are politicians. Um, of course, there's the more even more minority one. Voting unification, actually annexation, other either cooperation. Why not? Um, one of the politician Cohen's uh, uh, the chairman of he um, proposed to reopen the, the goods and services trade agreement with China, which were heavily criticized back in 2013 and 14 in Taiwan. Um, ironically, he was one of the politicians who opposed the, the idea of having a trade agreement with China back then, but he uh, his proposal, I think, at least party or his party supporter um, is proposing to uh, reopen that negotiation or again to sort of draw distance from this. Um, but that's all Taiwanese politics at play and uh, sort of because usually Taiwanese elections gets really um, 
gets crazier and crazier towards the end of the year. So the last three months, then uh, you have to pay extra attention to what you want to talk about. There are the not only being said by politicians, by media in Taiwan, but also by PRC actors. That's also why we did the five shortages analysis um, first. We're worried that domestic issues are also going to be uh, a, a big focus for presidential campaign. Ongoing for this way. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me turn next. Uh, how about the, this gentleman uh, here in the back? Could someone get a uh, microphone? Uh, get a mic uh, microphone to this gentleman here. Hey, uh, my name is Jim Wu. Uh, I come from uh, the nursing home from the uh, Institute of Medical Studies. And I currently visit uh, Stevenson Center. Uh, the first point I want to make is a short uh, comment. Um, I think there is a, co a close relation of between uh, the partisanship of between those who are tend to uh, supporters and who tend to believe in who are tend to more U.S. skeptical and those who are pen green supporters they tend to be uh, think or consider U.S. more credible. In fact, we have uh, uh, two ways of survey, which is can be found in the website called American Culture. You can find the national survey. And I, I actually I like uh, the, the presentation of all panels and other comments a, a lot. And I have one question for uh, Mr. Yu. Um, I would very much uh, to know what would be the data source of your data and how you categorize in, in different uh, groups in eight types and a lot of groups and how you choose the events and uh, I can have a um, more uh, better understanding how um, the criteria, how you uh, categorize that, how you select that. Then I think it will contribute by understanding. Thank you, sir. Um, um, uh, as my presentation was saying, uh, our data set is a cross platform Mandarin document archive. Uh, most of them from online sources Facebook, um, Taiwanese media, PRC state outlet, media outlets, like as big as Xinhua or Huanzhou, also similar like provincial news websites, uh, according to uh, this. Uh, this list of over 1,300 institutions at the PRC's Wang Xinban, the Wang Lu Xinxi Ban Longsi, their internet regulator, they publish a, a source and a, a list of credible information source. Uh, so we use that list to sort of track PRC outlet. Um, there's also you know, web forms at one that people use. E or e card, the cross platform database. How we choose to, how we choose the events, um, the judgment of our researchers. Um, most of the time, big political event in Taiwan. Um, there's definitely events that we don't have any report on, so that might be the places where we miss some of these narratives that might contribute to today's discussion. Um, but again, we have limited researchers that can only do so many reports per year. Um, as for the types, uh, the types are again decided by the researchers um, according to the narrative. Yeah, there's, there's really, um, this really depends on how the researchers see these narratives and decide which. Um, type it goes to, but usually each type have each type would have uh, important 
key phrases, I would say. Uh, for example, chat is a very important phrase for the eight random type. Um, or Luan Yuan, sort of chaos, a very important keyword for the C type of chaos like Wei Tai, structuring Taiwan, um, a very important key phrase for the H type structure. So usually the these sort of important or significant key phrases sort of emerges the more we look at the raw data um, and sort of an iterative process. Uh, for example, we back in 2022, me and John were talking about uh US Um at the time we only had have had around 30 narratives. Uh, there were only I think five types. And over the years when investigate more narratives in terms of both their content and their behavior in environment, we know more about the span of the scope of our research, hopefully for more readers. About the existence of narratives, but also the credibility of them. And at the beginning, saying we, we want to focus on the unreasonable or the manipulated narratives because there are a lot of credible and uh work uh discussion worthy topics about Taiwan US relations right um those are the things that it's necessary to have a site we want to focus on the unreasonable which might you know, be uh, various logical problems or the lack of evidence or the manipulated narratives that are, you know, evoking emotion, you know, evoking the, the fear of war. Narratives. Those are the, those are sort of our criteria, criteria of using uh, the 84 US skepticism narrative that we uh, have presented today. Hey, thank you for your help. Uh, we are coming close to the end of our time. I think we can run over just in a, a few more minutes. I uh, haven't gone uh, perhaps to this side of the room yet. Let me, uh, how about the, the gentleman there? Hi, thank you. Uh, oh, Andrew Hawkins, on a field frequent traveler to Taiwan. I, I was just wondering from, from you's initial report, they had a presentation. I could see that you were doing this presentation to Japan and Korea as well. At least you said had the titles exactly oh. the same Korean. Uh, actually, I was wondering, in general, what, uh, particularly Taiwan's neighbors, what both response as well as what is their involvement in terms of helping either the disinformation campaign and going against that or uh, giving other positive messages as well. I wonder what your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think it's actually really try in. I was, um, actually in Taiwan in July, and I participated in a conference um, held by Taiwan Fact Check Center, where they invited um, different fact checking organizations all over around the world to Taiwan. And I found that Taiwan's experiences are quite valuable to um, other countries' fact checking initiatives because we are also. We are also faced with similar um, problems, issues, because China's campaign are not only targeting at Taiwan, but also other countries. And also, I think um, there is a Ukrainian scholar talked to me saying that um, they they are really they really want to know how Taiwan tackles these issues because there are some narratives um, in. China's um, conspiracy theories and resonated with Russia's conspiracy theories. So I think it would be very valuable if we can have this kind of international cooperation to compare these narratives and to compare how we tackle these issues. It will be very, um, I think it will be very great if we can have this kind of initiative. Uh, yes, Ben. I don't know if you wanted to uh, uh, comment on that. 
the, the gentleman's question was uh, in regards to uh, sort of how these narratives may also connect to uh, some of Taiwan's other neighbors, whether, whether it's Japan or, or South Korea, and how that connects to uh, conversations or discourse in Taiwan. Uh, yes. So, do you mind? Can you hear me? Uh, maybe just give me a. Let you, John, can you hear me okay right now? Is that yeah, I'll, my, I'm, I'm, I apologies, Ben. I'm sorry. We'll have to look at uh, uh, the the audio connection. There. The the following connection is very very poor. My, my apologies. Um, well, uh, with that, uh, I think we're a little bit over on time. Uh, as is always the case, there is uh, so much more uh, about this topic that we could uh, delve into. So there, there's more discussion than there is time, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but we are at the end of our time today. I wanted to thank all of you for joining us, both those of you who came here in uh, person today and those who have joined us online. Uh, let me ask you, is there any round of applause? Uh, and uh, for all uh, of you interested in the programs that GTI does, I would advise you to keep an eye on our website. And also, we'll, we will be having another uh, public policy seminar in uh, two weeks uh, to look at issues uh, connected to uh, cultural diplomacy uh, and Taiwan. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you.